Good morning, everybody. Just wanted to get things started here. My name is Brandon Kennedy. I'm a PGY3 here. I'll be moderating today for a couple of great cases. First up, we have Dr. Nana Amakari presenting representation in ophthalmology. Fun fact about Nana Amakari is he's been exposed to a concerning amount of new foods here in Utah, and he's now considered to have a distinguished palate. I once heard a rumor that the first time he had pancakes was here on a camping trip with Dr. Petty. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but possibly so. All right, here you go now. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the fantastic introduction, Brandon. Uh, so today I'll be talking to you guys about a retreat I went to uh, about a month ago called Pillar, um, which uh, was about representation in ophthalmology, specifically academic ophthalmology. That didn't work. I use the mouse. Already, so uh, this is just a picture from uh, the conference. Uh, it was hosted at Byers Eye Institute at Stanford. Uh, this is Mubarak and I. I took as many pictures as possible with Mubarak. He's incredibly photogenic. Um, here's some additional photos and uh, a photo with Dr. Singh, uh, one of the glaucoma uh, attendings at uh, Stanford, who's there. Uh, so Pillar stands for a program in lasting leadership and academic representation. Uh, and, and why is this important? Um, so there was a uh, paper published by um, a group called, uh, headed by Miller and Katz, who are, uh, they had a, cons a consulting company uh, that deals with Fortune 500 companies, uh, work with uh, companies globally to, to elevate the quality of interactions, uh, leverage people's differences, and, and really transform workplaces uh, to make it a more inclusive and uh, really uh, an environment where you can prosper. And so these were several quotes that were from employees from these organizations. Uh, includes uh, the following. Um, inclusion challenges our thinking, brings in fresh perspectives, raises the bar for our practices and, and strengthens the gene pool. Inclusion fosters engagement and engagement itself increases uh, efficiency. Our decision-making is enhanced when people feel included. And so I just wanted to quickly glance at the uh, demographics of the US population. This is from uh, 2018 um, by race and ethnicity. So about 60% white, 18% Hispanic slash Latino. 13% uh, Black, 6% uh, uh, Asian, and about 2% identified as multicultural or multiracial, 1% uh, American Indian, and about half a percent or less than half a percent uh, Native Hawaiian. And then in the child population represented by the bar uh, below, it just shows that uh, there's more uh, diversity amongst that total population. And this is the uh, profile uh, published by the uh, SF match last year uh, from the years 2017, 2022, showing residency demographics. And uh, I wanted to draw your attention specifically to the years uh, prior to 2021, uh, whereby Black and African Americans were represented uh, one to 3% of the time, uh, about 5%-ish uh, uh, identified as multiracial, 7%-ish um, uh, Hispanic slash Latino. Uh, so many uh, declined to state or uh, what they represented as and uh, around 25% Asian and then the rest 45 to 55% white. And then there's a similar represent, representation amongst uh, fellowship demographics as well. So there's a study by uh, Dr. Hannah Valentine uh, that looked at um, how the NIH could take a scientific approach to inclusive, uh, inclusive environments in general. Uh, so specifically they analyzed bio, biological and uh, biomedical sciences and and medicine amongst medical schools in the, in the year 2017 to 2018. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, the light yellow and the light, um, light blue uh, graph, parts of the graph um, that show uh, underrepresented women and men respectively. And you can see as, as you advance from associate degree, uh, kind of work your way up all the way up to department chair, uh, representation declines. And so one of the first thoughts that I think I have, and perhaps many people have, is, is, is implicit bias at work. Uh, and so a group at Stanford, uh, Dr. Pershing, uh, Stell, and, and Dr. Caroline Fisher, uh, kind of analyzed this amongst residency applicants. Um, they redacted uh, name, sex, gender, uh, to see if uh, bias was involved in, their, in the way in which they, they, they recruit applicants. And they, the results of their quality improvement study showed that uh, that was not the case. And so that brings me to uh, 
uh, one of the questions of, uh, this is a, a quote by uh, Dr. Caroline Fisher during uh, the pillar conference that really, really stuck with me. It was, uh, it's one thing to ask for help and another to have the language to ask for it. And uh, oftentimes as physicians, we're kind of challenged to, to, to really answer questions that patients have before they even know they have it. And uh, it's, it's not to say that a certain group needs uh, help more than another, but um, perhaps there are many ways in which we need to, to deeply analyze uh, representation and, and the way in which we can best represent our patients uh, uh, to provide the best care possible. And so Pillar uh, was hosted by uh, the Byers Eye Institute at Stanford, uh, Rad Venable Excellence in Ophthalmology Program and the National Medical Association of Ophthalmology. It targeted underrepresented uh, minorities in medicine, uh, specifically with preference to uh, PGY2s in, uh, amongst ophthalmology residents. And once again, it took place last month, uh, September 24th and 25th. The National Medical Association was founded in 1895. It's the largest and oldest uh, organization representing African-American physicians and healthcare professionals in the United States. It focuses on health issues uh, related to minorities, disadvantaged, and uh, medically underserved populations. Uh, it's one of the leading voices for uh, parity and, and disparity amongst, uh, 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 or parities in, in health and, and, and justice in medicine, uh, and, and with the goals of elimination disparities in health. The Rad Venable Excellence in Ophthalmology program was uh, named for Dr. Maurice Rab, Drs. Maurice Rab and Dr. Uh, uh, Howard P. Venable, uh, both of whom were nationally recognized with, amongst their respective fields, but also uh, for what they did in terms of uh, how they helped the next man forward. Um, they both combated the inequities of their time by excelling as a, almost as a form of protest. So the Rab Venable Excellence in Ophthalmology program was founded in 2000 as a research uh, competition in Washington, D.C. Um, by 2007, uh, gained national recognition by the NEI and NIH. Uh, and then as a result of COVID, it uh, kind of had a migration to a more virtual format uh, that helped uh, uh, third and fourth year medical students who were interested in ophthalmology kind of uh, provide an opportunity for career development, uh, mentorship, uh, navigating the application process. And this is just a, a random photo from uh, the Pillar Conference. Uh, last month. Uh, and then I wanted to draw your attention to the uh, article listed below. Um, this was analyzing the contributions of Rab Venable over the years, uh, specifically uh, with attention to uh, the year 2020 to 2021 and, and how uh, uh, Rab Venable has contributed to, to some of the changes that uh, we've experienced in the demographics of ophthalmology. And so I wanted to take another look at this uh, graph here again, a little bit closer of a look here. Uh, I have no comments for this, but <laughs> even closer than that. <laughs> uh, from the year 2020 to 2021, uh, Black and people who identify as Black and African American, uh, there was a substantial increase uh, from 1.3 to 5.4 percent, which is about a 300 percent increase. And that uh, was sustained uh, or increased even further uh, to 7 percent in the subsequent year. Uh, of note, Hispanic and Latino, represented by the dark green. Uh, did decline during that period from 7.4 to 5% and then back up to 8%. And so the Rab Venable program saw this as a resounding success. Uh, this was a, that was a, a really pivotal year in, in, in the way in which they uh, um, combated uh, how they can help uh, students of color uh, really get into ophthalmology and, and, and succeed in it. And so this was a group of us at the Pillar uh, or, uh, retreat last month and really, uh, this was a lot of our first times meeting each other in person. We've been through so many conferences together, so many uh, virtual uh, uh, formats, and, and it was really, really awesome to be able to, to, to see one another in person and, and, and really share our unique experiences together again. And I just wanted to draw some attention to, to, to George uh, from the FAST 2021, and then, of course, my co-resident Mubarak, who's also part of the Rab Venable organization. And so Pillar uh, had several different main uh, components uh, many of which are listed here, but it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, there was the career paths in ophthalmology. There was uh, talking about grants and research funding, fellowships, uh, navigating academic careers, uh, inclusion and diversity, uh, sharing uh, their shared experiences, uh, mentorship, and then work-life integration. It was formatted in a way that it had seven different uh, big sessions. Um, there was uh, presentations on each specific topic, followed by Q&A, and then four 20-minute table sessions afterwards. Uh, one of these sessions was Career Paths in Academic Ophthalmology, whereby uh, Dr. Amara Ross from uh, UPenn 
I discussed laboratory, laboratory research as a career path in ophthalmology. Specifically, she shared her, her joys of, of lab research, uh, ways in which you can find support, mentorship in the institution, and uh, really choosing an institution to best uh, promote that uh, path if that's something you're interested in. And then Dr. Nicholas Volpe uh, from Chicago kind of uh, showed a different, uh, I guess a contrasting career path uh, whereby he highlighted a master clinician as a career path that one can pursue and uh, its important role in academic departments. And then Dr. Loretta from uh, Wilmer uh, discussed uh, residency, residency PD as a career path in ophthalmology and, and how she has the opportunity to have significant impacts on the lives of others and uh, really a career of, of mentorship. She discussed uh, uh, scholarship and, and, and the creation of knowledge amongst uh, so many, uh, as well as the various ways you can take paths to that, that ultimate goal. Dr. Paul Lee from Michigan discussed negotiating and accepting the first job what one should, should prioritize, uh, like family uh, and uh, uh, benefits with, uh, with regards to contractual negotiations. He also discussed sources of assistance, uh, choosing a lawyer, uh, if, if things I didn't even think about uh, uh, with regards to navigating that process. Dr. Dolly Chang discussed industry and academia and how there's kind of hybrid fellowships that exist out there and uh, ongoing collaboration uh, between industry and academia. And then Dr. Mildred Olivier uh, discussed DEI leadership as a career path, uh, specifically Rab Venable, who, where she uh, serves as the president and, and uh, local department school leadership opportunities, importance of representation, and increasing recognition for career advancement and promotions. And so along those lines, uh, I thought uh, deeply about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and ways in which we can really uh, tackle that. Um, Dr. Olivier brought up uh, this paper, uh, Patching the Leaks, uh, re Revitalizing and Reimagining the STEM Pipeline. And in summary, it's about early exposure, early and often exposure. Um, so there's exposures to research, exposures to internships, work experiences, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then that got me thinking a lot about my own personal journey. From when I was 13, uh, I've had the opportunity to be a part of various different uh, 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 pipeline uh, experiences. I think specifically to my very first one, it was called the White Foundation. Uh, it's a program uh, for, for individuals in Newark, New Jersey, uh, who uh, specifically underrepresented individuals in, in Newark, New Jersey, who uh, there's a ton of research supporting the fact that uh, there are plenty of people qualified, but who didn't necessarily get the, um, uh, I guess, op opportunity to, to, to obtain uh, college scholarships. And uh, this program started really, really young, I actually had us going to uh, class after school uh, every Wednesday and Friday and, and then on Saturdays as well. Um, so it was, it was exhaustive, it was exhausting and uh, uh, really, really rewarding because it ultimately provided a pathway for us to uh, obtain scholarships to boarding schools at the time and then uh, actually assisted us with college as well. Uh, so it was a really a transformation, transform, uh, transformative experience for me and so many of my peers who were, who were fortunate enough to be a, a part of this program with me. And I listed some other programs that uh, have helped me along the way as well. And that brings me to uh, some of my most rewarding experiences, uh, kind of uh, things I've, I've been a part of or founded that have uh, similarly uh, looked at goals of, of influencing others um, along the way. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss possible challenges that exist when you're, you're kind of thrust in these uh, environments whereby maybe not everyone looks like you or, or, or comes from uh, environments with, with which you came from. Um, some of the challenges of, of, of that include feeling like you have to be more, conf more than confident to do the job, feeling like you have to be able to fit into the organization and its culture, uh, uh, willingness to accept the spotlight and, and, and being the only one of your kind. Uh, able to represent an entire identity group, sometimes on your own, uh, capable of disproving colleagues' preconceptions about members of your identity group, uh, able to deal with constant questioning as to whether the job was obtained as a result of your merit or, or, or your differences, um, serving on committees, task forces, public appearances related to your identity, none of which is necessarily your job responsibility or considered in your performance appraisal, and then of course assisting as needed with recruiting and outreach. And this is also uh, listed in, in the article I previously mentioned from Miller and Katz. And so what can we do? Uh, in addition to the just generalized support that we, we, 
we, we do a great job of here. Uh, there's a variety of different programs that we can kind of expose uh, students uh, underrepresented in, in, in medicine to if they, they have an interest specifically with ophthalmology. Uh, that includes the, the aforementioned RAV Venable program but also the Minority and Ophthalmology Mentorship Program, which is a similar program that helps uh, students become ophthalmology applicants um, and competitive ones at, at that. Uh, it's, it's headed by the AAO, uh, provides a similar one-on-one -on -one mentorship, another opportunity for networking and uh, educational resources as well. And then uh, uh, more recently, I've been uh, exposed to a group called the Black Physicians of Utah, which uh, is really, really uh, fascinating because they, they target high school uh, and as early as middle school students in, in the Utah area, um, uh, get them exposure to, to medicine in general. I know the other day they, they uh, helped uh, introduce how to put in IVs and they were asking for some, some medical help. And honestly, I, I, I wasn't very much help at all, but I thought it was really, it was really, really cool to, to at least uh, show these individuals, uh, you know, get them some type of exposure to that, 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 that health pathway. And, and uh, for me, it's, it's, the most rewarding aspect is, is both the exposure that we can assist with, but also the sense of community uh, that exists here. Because um, being uh, underrepresented in medicine is, is kind of a, a U.S. Uh, issue, but also uh, more prominent in the, in, in the state of Utah as well. And so one of my, my, my good friends and longtime men mentors from high school, uh, Dr. Mike Quist, uh, he's an ophthalmologist in, at Cleveland Clinic now. Uh, he was at the Pillar Conference, and, and he say this quote that, that has really, really stuck with me. I think it's just a fantastic quote. It's actually originally from his father, but uh, kind of passed along the way. And he said that when life gives you the opportunity to take the stairs up, uh, make sure you send this, the elevator back down. And it's something I, I personally want to continue to live by and, and, and promote uh, for the rest of my life, but also um, um, I'm hoping to inspire others to do so as well. So I want to give a, a quick thank you to uh, the Byers Eye Institute for, for hosting, as well as the Rab Venable and NMA uh, program. Uh, to Dr. Petty to, for letting us, uh, me and, and Mubarak, know of this uh, uh, retreat. Uh, and then uh, my colleagues at Iowa, Dr. Cy Lewis and Arnulf Arnulf Garza, who uh, uh, helped me with the collaboration of this presentation. And then here are some pictures from uh, our own mini retreat uh, about a month ago as well. Uh, we went camping uh, at Buckeye Lake and it was an awesome experience. And in addition to my distinguished palate, I now have a distinguished sense of sight. Uh, <laughs> we used binoculars. It was really, really fun and really cool. Uh, unique experience for me and, and, and super rewarding. So I now will take any questions, comments, ideas. Happy to entertain. Thank you so much for your attention. I think when people are first coming, you know, and, and looking at, you know, the underrepresent, underrepresentation of medicine, it, it just looks like a pipeline problem, problem entirely, right? Like, well, what could we do if there's just not enough medical students in the pipeline? And, and while those are essential and fundamental, um, over time, you start to see the challenges of the graph you showed uh, with uh, the, the trends in biology, right? So, you know, as, as you come in, much more diverse, and by the time you're getting down to full professor, it's uh, it's really important to push those underrepresented kind of groups to a significant minority in the, in the group, and so you know, that's the part that that to me seems less just simple, right? It's like okay, we can do we can put more effort into pipelining, but this kind of systemic and structural challenge, uh, you know, in, in your how would you assess this? I mean, how much of this is mentorship? How much is this culture? If you were to advise, you know, a department, uh, a school, what would you recommend to address this particular issue of attrition? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I think of Pillar and my experience first and foremost with that. Uh, there were so many things I was just uh, really oblivious to before uh, that, that retreat in general. Uh, so uh, Dr. Rowetta talked about uh, the path of GD, for instance. I had no idea what was a typical, uh, saying with associate deans, a, a typical uh, uh, pathway to that, or uh, you know, uh, a whole variety of different uh, mechanisms to do that. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's both explaining that course, but also promoting excellence. So uh, it's, it's one thing to, to kind of 
for us people who are in the position they're not ready for. And it's another thing to prepare them for. Uh, and so I really think it does start early with pipeline and getting more and more people uh, interested in medicine in general, first and foremost, and, and then eventually ophthalmology as well. But we really have to make sure that the people who do come through uh, become the best they can be. Um, and, and that's the only way that this would be a sustainable uh, uh, habit if we, if we were to promote these people to you know, a variety of different positions. They really need to, to excel. Um, I look back at uh, from uh, uh, Langston Hughes to, to uh, the, uh, some of the Dr. Rad Venable and, and so many other uh, different people. It, it, you, you really have to excel in those positions to, to inspire people to want to continue to do that and put those forward, uh, people forward in the future. Thank you. Great question. Um, so I, I just had a couple of thoughts and I was curious to hear your perspective about a lot of the programs that you were involved in early on. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with a couple and I know it's still an application process that is overall somewhat competitive. And uh, amongst the underrepresented students, there's still a unequal distribution of like allocated resources. So how do you think we can better tackle the individuals who aren't even aware of these programs early on or those who do apply and don't get into these pipeline programs maybe because they don't have similar backgrounds or access to resources as others that are considered unrepresented? Yeah, and I think that's another fantastic question. So a lot, a lot of people in RAP Venable uh, did not obtain, uh, uh, I guess, admission to uh, the Minority Ophthalmology Mentorship Program headline at AEO. They just had such a limited supply of resources they couldn't accept everyone uh, into that program. Uh, and then there's another half of people who just never heard of it, um, despite uh, having interest in ophthalmology for uh, four years of medical school or, or longer. Um, uh, the resource thing is a, it's a tough uh, endeavor. Uh, I, I guess we can uh, obviously put more, more resources into it, but. Uh, I don't know, I, I couldn't tell you from that standpoint of, of, of what we really uh, can afford and can't afford. Um, but in terms of the exposure, I, I think it's almost a shame if, if someone uh, was in medical school and, and from an underserved background and didn't hear about it. Because it's such a nationally recognized, a lot of these programs are very nationally recognized. And, uh, so someone just needs to show that care uh, to really uh, bring it to their attention. But then also it's, it's, it's you don't have to necessarily tell them these programs, just uh, invoke curiosity. Uh, so. There's, in my opinion, there's this minimal excuse to not know uh, uh, what things are out there if you're interested enough for it. Um, and sometimes it, it's just uh, asking them how bad they want it uh, or, or, or putting forward um, uh, the question of what have they done to seek or obtain that goal that they're aspiring for. Um, because there are many ways that we live in the world of Google whereby a lot of these things will pop up. Uh, so we just have to be curious enough to find them. Yeah, thank you. Not just one more question, comment, mm -hmm. you know, talking about systemic structural issues related to this. I remember applying to medical school and, and if you didn't have a certain amount of volunteer hours, you, you wouldn't even get an interview at certain medical schools. And, and in hindsight, you know, we, we are trying to move more toward, you know, what's called holistic review and look at this thing called distance traveled. And, you know, seeing someone who, you know, worked full time, you know, as, as a waiter or waitress through all four years of undergrad, you know, my goodness, like, like what, what is showing, you know, more, more grit and commitment than that, even if they didn't have the financial freedom to volunteer or Research is the same way. Research volunteering, the research positions are largely volunteer. And that, you know, this, you know, doesn't necessarily you know, directly correlate with race, but, you know, those with resources and ability to volunteer for a summer and not worry about, you know, making ends meet. Uh, again, that structurally just you know, keeps this, you know, pipeline of privilege uh, into medicine. It's something that, that we need to acknowledge as well in the process. I think very much related to that is the application process itself doesn't allow you to highlight something like that. So if you look at someone's application, they'll be, you know, like previous career experience, say, one, you know, one bar and you'll see waiter. There's really nowhere else for them to highlight, like, unless they choose to talk about it in their personal statement. So I think structurally, it's recognizing that that's an issue, but then also changing 
the rubric by which we're evaluating people in a much, you're thinking much more outside of the box and allowing people to highlight that as a part of the standardized application instead of recognizing that we as reviewers need to, you know, need to dig for it. It should be able to be much more, you know, applicants should be able to highlight it much easier. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because it's a college application that actually you do have an opportunity to list how many hours you put in and uh, are dedicated to a certain activity or work. So I do think it would be uh, more ideal to, to, to be able to expose uh, just how burdensome a certain job might have been for you or how passionate you are about certain activity with the uh, hours you put in. Yeah. Um. One, one of the things that um, I think speaks to what Ren was talking about was the outreach in middle school and elementary school. And that's a lot of the, uh, the middle school students um, being introduced to STEM and you know, coming up to the university. If it, if it isn't even an idea, then you won't go looking, Googling for how do I be a doctor if, you, if it doesn't even cross your consciousness that could be possible. It relies so much on um, your teachers, your counselors saying, hey, you know, there's this career you could do because I just, I, I think that people are, um, are aware of the things that are around them. Yeah, I think that's one of the more important uh, points too as well. Uh, we, uh, like I think about where I came from and how really medicine was not an encouraged uh, uh, pathway just because no one around us would really in that. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have a parent who was pursuing it on my own uh, pursuits, during my own pursuits as well, but um, there are so many uh, individuals who are kind of pushed towards uh, other things as a result of uh, the lack of uh, role models to, to, to uh, really think about like medicine or STEM in general. Um, so it really is something that uh, we have to be more dedicated for attacking early. And I see so many, even the, the paper I, I the chart I showed, it started at the undergraduate level, but it really starts far earlier than that. It, uh, I think at the undergraduate level, it's almost too late um, to, to, to make a significant impact uh, because especially nowadays with, with medical school, you have to have such a, a robust application, uh, so many work, work experiences, volunteering, uh, opportunities like, like that that you talked about. Uh, and it starts early and, and we have to do a better job at uh, attacking that. Thank you so much, Dr. McCary. Great presentation and really a topic that I think we can agree on that we can all discuss for over 30 minutes. Um, yeah, thank you. That was incredible. Next up, we have Dr. Ashley Polsky. Um, she comes to us from the great, great, great state of Michigan. Um, and she will be presenting. Don't go chasing waterfalls, minimally invasive management of a bleeding iris bath or tough. And a fun fact about Dr. Polsky is she once did a seabird ecology research on protected island in Puget, uh, <laughs> still, 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 <laughs> near Seattle, for four summers in college. So now she knows an unusual amount about seagulls. So welcome, Dr. Polsky. What are the pigeon of the sea? All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, as many of you know, part of our responsibilities as an intern in this program is to run the ophthalmology walk-in clinic at the VA hospital. And the case that I'll be presenting today is actually one of the first patients that I saw in that intern clinic last year. So I'm really excited to share it with you. Let's see. There we go. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And uh, this case begins with a 74-year-old man who presented to our VA walk-in clinic with painless generalized blurry vision that uh, developed in his left eye about five hours earlier. 
Uh, he denied any flashes or floaters in his vision, and he had no recent history of eye trauma, prior eye surgery, or any history of anticoagulant use. His past medical history included hypertension, which was reportedly well-controlled on amlodipine, and his ocular history was significant for a branch retinal vein occlusion of the left eye that occurred in 2013 and was complicated by neovascularization of the iris and retina. Um, he did undergo intravitreal Avastin injections for that in 2013, as well as PRP treatment in 2015 and 2017. He uh, briefly followed with our VA glaucoma service for neovascular glaucoma, but this had remained quiescent since 2017. For his ocular medications, he was using bromonidine drops daily in his left eye. He had no relevant family or social history, and specifically, he had no personal or family history of bleeding disorders. His visual acuity on initial presentation was 2025 minus two in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. He had full color vision, normal pupillary responses, and full extraocular motility and visual fields to confrontation. Uh, his intraocular pressure was 14 in the right eye and slightly elevated at 22 in the left eye. His anterior segment examination of the right eye was within normal limits aside from an age-related cataract, and his left eye demonstrated diffuse conjunctival injection. And before I kind of further discuss his slit lamp examination, I'd like to show you a few examples of what we saw in clinic. So this is what I saw on my very initial external examination of the left eye. You can imagine that my heart started racing a little bit when I saw this as a brand new ophthalmology intern. I think I called Brandon like two seconds after seeing this. Um, and then this video, which hopefully will play here. This is what we saw on slit lamp exam. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, very cool video. Thank you to Brandon for taking this. Okay, so that was what we saw on, on slit lamp exam. Um, so as you can see in that video, uh, this patient had a four millimeter layering hyphema inferiorly in the left eye that was being fed by this continuous filiform hemorrhage originating from what appeared to be a small vascular tuft at around one o'clock on the pupillary margin. There was no observable neovascularization of the anterior surface of the iris. However, we did see very subtle vessels suggestive of NVA temporally um, in the ear to corneal angle on gonioscopy. Dilated examination was unremarkable in the right eye and in the left eye demonstrated findings consistent with this patient's prior known BRVO including some superior shunt vessels and a sclerotic vessel that was branching from the superior arcade. There was no neovascularization of the disc or the retina, and he had stable, dense PRP scars superiorly consistent with his prior laser treatments. Uh, we did obtain a blood pressure measurement while the patient was in our clinic as well, and that measured uh, 141 over 83. So this list represents some of the major differential diagnoses that we were considering for the etiology of this patient's hyphema. Um, some sort of iris vascular lesion was really at the top of our list, given that the bleed appeared to be originating from a tuft-like structure um, at the pupillary margin. Iris neovascularization was also a very important consideration given this patient's prior history of a BRVO and previous need for anti-VEGF therapy. However, he did not have obvious NVI, and uh, the NVA that we saw on gonioscopy was not actively bleeding. 
Uh, traumatic hyphema and UGG syndrome seemed less likely in this case, given his lack of previous eye trauma or any pre prior surgeries. Um, and systemically, he had no history of constitutional symptoms or easy bleeding or bruising to suggest a systemic coagulopathy. So at this point in our workup, uh, a bleeding iris vascular tuft was our leading diagnosis. Uh, throughout our slit lamp and dilated exam, the iris continued to bleed just like what you saw in that video. Um, so our primary goal at this point was to stop this bleeding and hopefully prevent any adverse sequelae such as corneal blood staining or prolonged increases in this patient's intraocular pressure. Uh, given our concern for possible subtle NVA on gonioscopy and given this patient's previous success with anti-VEGF therapy, um, we did decide to proceed with in a Bastin injection in his left eye. Uh, we monitored this patient's intraocular pressure very closely after this injection and measured a pressure of 48 immediately after the procedure, followed by a pressure of 35 about 10 minutes later. We had hoped that uh, this pressure elevation that uh, occurred as a result of the intravitreal injection would have a tamponade-like effect to uh, promote hemostasis of that iris bleed. Unfortunately, on reevaluation at the slit lamp, that hemorrhage continued to really steadily flow into the anterior chamber. So our next course of action was to pressure patch the eye. Um, and as illustrated in these photographs here, we uh, developed a pressure patch by placing two eye pads over his closed left eye and applying tape really firmly over the patches to hold them in place. Uh, we kept that pressure patch on for 30 minutes. And when the patch was removed, the active hemorrhage had completely resolved. After achieving hemostasis, we discussed standard hyphema precautions with the patient and sent him home on Predforte, uh, atropine, and COSAT drops in the left eye. The patient returned to clinic the following day and was found to have a visual acuity of 20, 30, minus 1 in the left eye with an intraocular pressure of 10. And uh, as you can see here, that inferior layering hyphema had decreased in height to about one millimeter. And um, that arrow there is pointing to a quiescent vascular tuft that was noted at um, the location of the previous hemorrhage on the pupillary margin. It's a little tough to see, I think, but it's kind of a whitish tuft-like structure there. Um, we followed this patient really closely over the following weeks, and by week three, his hyphema had completely resolved. Um, his intraocular pressure remained normal on COSOPT, and he had no recurrent episodes of bleeding. Um, so we were able to discontinue his atropine and taper off the prednisolone. At one month after his initial presentation, uh, we were able to obtain an iris fluorescein angiogram here at the Moran Eye Center. And interestingly, we saw irregular hyperfluorescence and staining bilaterally at the pupillary margins, consistent with the presence of bilateral iris vascular tufts. And there in the close up of the left eye, where the arrow is pointing, you can see the culprit of this patient's previous hemorrhage with that little tuft like structure there. As of uh, two weeks ago, this patient has had no recurrence of an iris vascular tuft bleed or hyphema. Um, he was able to actually successfully undergo cataract surgery in both eyes last month with uh, Dr. Swiston, Dr. Petty, and Dr. Larachelle, and he is now seeing 2020 in both eyes. So for the rest of this talk, I'd like to just further discuss iris vascular tufts, as well as some of the various approaches to their management. Um, iris vascular tufts, also known as Cobb tufts or iris microhemangiomatosis, are uh, relatively rare benign vascular lesions that form along the pupillary border, just like we saw in our patient. Um, these small tufts can range anywhere from 15 to 150 microns in size, and they account for less than 5% of all iris vascular tumors. 
they're typically found in elderly patients and they have no known sex or racial um, predisposition. Interestingly, for largely unknown reasons, um, they are found at an increased frequency in patients with myotonic dystrophy and diabetes. Um, and in terms of uh, clinical presentation, typically patients with iris vascular tufts are actually completely asymptomatic. And so I think it's very possible that these go unrecognized um, a majority of the time. Often the initial uh, presenting symptom is a sudden onset of blurry vision due to the development of a hyphema, um, similar to what we saw in our patient. And this bleeding often occurs in the absence of any preceding ocular trauma or systemic vasculopathic conditions. Iris vascular tufts are generally considered an idiopathic acquired vascular anomaly. Um, in our patient, the fact that he had bilateral iris vascular tufts really suggests against any sort of causal relationship between his previous BRVO and his iris vascular tuft development. Um, however, interestingly, some, patient, some papers have suggested that the ischemic and hemodynamic changes promoted by vascular occlusions might actually contribute to alterations in vascular tuft structure making them more prone to spontaneous bleeding. So one question that we had regarding our patient was whether his prior BRVO may have somehow contributed to a heightened bleeding risk in that eye through maybe upregulation of VEGF or through some other mechanism that led to increased vascular permeability. And that was partly why we had a low threshold to treat him with intravitreal avastin on that day. Uh, the diagnosis of iris vascular tufts is primarily made by slit lamp examination along with fluorescein angiography of the iris. And as you can see in uh, these photos here, the classic appearance of vascular tufts on an iris FA is rapid hyperfluorescence along the pupillary margin, along with um, often late staining or leakage at the margin there. And in these patients, um, it's actually common for iris FA to identify multiple additional small vascular tufts that were not readily visible on slit lamp exam alone. Uh, the Shields group at Wills Eye Institute also suggested anterior segment optical coherence tomography and geography or OCTA as a potential imaging modality to further characterize these tufts. On OCTA, uh, the appearance of iris microhemangiomatosis consists of non-dilated, um, normal appearing iris vessels that then coalesce into these uh, tightly coiled vascular tufts at the pupillary margin. Um, when they used a cross-sectional anterior segment OCT with an angio overlay, which is pictured at the bottom of this figure, um, they were able to localize these vascular tufts to the posterior iris stroma rather than superficially on the iris where neovascularization typically occurs. Um, additionally, studies of OCTA um, and iris vascular lesions are somewhat limited. And so um, at the moment, anterior segment FA really remains the supplemental imaging modality of choice for iris vascular tufts. Most commonly, iris vascular tufts can be observed without any additional intervention. Uh, topical steroids and atropine with or without IOP lowering drops can be initiated in the event of a hyphema. And for more definitive management, uh, argon laser photocoagulation has been described for the treatment of iris vascular tufts. In this approach, the laser is directed often both at the tuft itself, as well as the feeder vessel leading to that tuft in order to either stop or prevent active bleeding. And I've just listed here some of the laser settings that have been reported in previous studies that used argon laser to treat actively bleeding iris vascular tufts. This table is from a 2010 literature review of laser photocoagulation for iris vascular tufts. Um, of the eight cases included here, five patients were treated with laser photocoagulation, 
either for an active iris vascular tuft bleed or for a history of recurrent hyphema. Um, two patients with a history of recurrent hyphema were actually treated prophylactically prior to cataract surgery in order to reduce the risk of intraoperative bleeding. And one patient required repeated treatment with argon laser due to recurrent bleeding. But um, as you can see in the outcome column to the right, um, the majority of patients had no additional bleeding episodes within their follow-up period. Uh, here's an example of a case from 2013 in which a patient had active bleeding from an iris vascular tuft that was treated with argon laser photocoagulation. Uh, this particular iris was treated with just a single spot of argon laser at the pupillary margin, and uh, hemostasis was successfully achieved immediately afterwards. Uh, due, due to the rarity of iris vascular tufts, there, there is somewhat sparse literature regarding its treatment, particularly as it relates to actively bleeding tufts. Um, and while argon laser has been shown to successfully arrest active hemorrhage, just like what we saw on the previous slide, um, it does entail its own set of risks, including damage to the iris or other ocular structures, um, further exacerbating anterior chamber bleeding, um, or causing corneal endothelial decompensation. Um, so because of these potential risks, argon laser is typically reserved for patients who have had recurrent hemorrhage from vascular tufts or as a prophylactic measure to prevent bleeding during intraocular surgery, like we saw with that um, previous literature review. Additionally, um, a really good point that Brandon discussed when this case initially came in is that um, timely access to an argon laser may be really difficult, um, especially in settings with limited resources. So what other options might we consider when faced with an actively bleeding iris vascular tuft? And based on our case, um, we would suggest that a pressure patch is a very accessible minimally invasive first line approach to stop active bleeding in an, of an iris vascular tuft. Um, this approach does require an extended period of observation in the clinic. Um, like I said, we were patching this patient for 30 minutes um, and also monitoring him really closely before and afterwards. Um, but the benefit is that it can be performed in a variety of settings, including in really low resource areas without significant risk of damage to intraocular structures. If active bleeding continues despite pressure patching, then additional more invasive modalities such as argon laser should be considered. Um, and although there's limited literature regarding the benefit of anti-VEGF therapy for iris vascular tufts, uh, intravitreal avastin, for example, is another re reasonable consideration, um, particularly in the rare setting of iris vascular tufts and vascular occlusion, um, as we saw in our patient. So in conclusion, iris vascular tufts are a rare but known cause of spontaneous hyphema, particularly in elderly patients. Uh, pressure patching is a safe and very accessible option to successfully achieve hemostasis in the setting of an active tuft bleed. And for the rare scenario of a recurrent or persistent iris vascular tuft bleed, um, additional modalities such as argon laser treatment can be pursued for more definitive management. Um, I'd like to again thank Brandon Kennedy, who uh, saw this patient with me at the VA back when he was a PGY2 resident. As you can see here, I repaid him with a free refraction. Um, and also many thanks to uh, Dr. Bear and Dr. Simpson for providing really valuable clinical guidance in managing this case. Um, and we actually recently submitted this case for publication as a case report along with that really cool video. Um, and it's currently undergoing peer review. Here's a list of my references, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. So just one thing that I uh, in, in, with the patching, obviously, the key thing that we're trying to do with the pressure patch is raise the pressure high enough to try to block bleeding. But 
where you have a combination where you've already got an active like FEMA and you've already got uh, pressures that, that could be elevated and then a pressure patch all at the same time, uh, you just got to be careful that you could actually uh, raise the pressure above the arterial pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we can do that short term. I mean, that, that's what's one way of stopping the meeting for days, but 30 minutes <coughs> could be a problem. And, and uh, a, a way that you could do the same thing that uh, uh, I know can be quite effective is that uh, you can sit there and you can actually just kind of put your finger on the eye and you can push it and you push hard enough and you'll watch it stop. You're probably at the arterial pressure at that point. Mm -hmm. And then hold it there for a couple of minutes and just gently lift off. And uh, often it's in place, but you're monitoring it and you're not doing it for a long period of time. So that's just that's that's a that's a very simple way. I know with gonioscopy, they can do the same thing where they know there's bleeding by just by holding the pressure, but you're watching it. And it's not something where you're not sure what that pressure is, you know, for, for how long. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And I and I should mention we tried kind of compression gonioscopy as well when we were looking at his AC um, and I believe just kept persisting. Just the, the finger up to the upper lid, you just, you're watching it and you hold, you push, 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 you'll get to a point where it'll stop. Yeah, that's I'm sure that's arterial that's pressure really you are. Right. Yeah. Just give it enough time so that uh, something can start, the little fiber can start to right when you can get that thing started. Yeah, and it would be interesting to see too if more like limited trials of pressure patching for maybe 10 minutes or something could achieve the same effect as opposed to 30 minutes. But yeah, thank you. That's a really, really good point. Thank you.